Welcome to the Good Leadership Podcast, where we engage with esteemed thought leaders and explore research-backed strategies and techniques that empower leaders at every level to achieve meaningful results that drive lasting change. Well, welcome to this episode of the Good Leadership Podcast. Today, I'm delighted to be joined by Jen Shirkani, who's a nationally recognized expert on emotional intelligence and a featured speaker at national and state conferences, universities, and government agencies. She is the author of the best-selling book, Ego vs. EQ and Choose Resilience, Guides for Leveraging the Power of Emotional Intelligence. She has spent over 25 years working with organizations from Fortune 50 to family-owned entities as a business consultant and executive coach. In addition to emotional intelligence, she frequently speaks and writes about workplace challenges, including interviewing and selection, employee engagement and motivation, generational differences, and coachability. Thanks for joining me on the program, Jen. Happy to be here. Love to start out each episode with just our listeners learning more about my guests. If you wouldn't mind just filling us in on your background and what got you interested on this topic. Sure. So I have spent now 35 years or so on um, in some kind of a role related to talent management. I worked in-house at several organizations, small and large, in their corporate learning and development groups and helped kind of understand how we need to learn as adults and what professional skills are most important, especially in leadership. So I went from in-house to going out on my own. I've had my own firm now for 25 years, and I've worked with organizations around the world, some small, a lot of very large Fortune 500, Fortune 100s, all around talent development, particularly leadership. And I got interested in emotional intelligence pretty early on because I realized the power of it, and I thought... I can't really teach somebody how to manage conflict if they don't have the self-awareness to understand kind of the role they're playing in this or how to be a better leader and how that's impacting the world around you. So I thought it was such a great kind of foundational skill initially. So I got certified in some of the assessments 20 years ago and folded that into my practice, done a lot of executive coaching over the years and kind of watched how emotional intelligence looks in real life and where some of the obstacles are to using emotional intelligence once you have it. And so I really dedicated my whole career and my firm to this topic because I learned the complexity of it and also the importance of it. Well, I love your book and your stance on it. And I love the title of the book, Ego Versus EQ. What's kind of, if you could just explain briefly the central concept to the book, because we're going to unpack these traps that you have in the book in more detail, but if you could, you know, the central concept of your book, Ego versus EQ, and why it's so important for leaders to understand this concept. Yeah, it's it it was an interesting title. It it really came out of again watching leaders as they were interacting with their teams and their stakeholders. And I don't really mean ego like arrogance or self-centeredness. I really mean is my comfort zone taking priority over the people around me? And and here's why I call it a trap or why there's traps here, because I watched organizations function in a way designed to keep the senior leaders comfortable. The system is set up to keep the senior leaders comfortable. So it's easy to think everything's going great when you're in this senior leadership bubble, but actually I'm watching everything around this person and people hiding stuff and not always hiding it because they're afraid they don't want the leader to know, but also because they like the leader, they respect the leader, and they want to just handle stuff right without needing to bother them with it. But what it can result in is a perception that senior leaders can get about the way the world is working at their organizations that isn't quite connected to reality. Love to start out before we unpack some of these great pieces is really emotional intelligence, right? That word, that term came into existence around 1995 with Dr. Daniel Goleman. Since then, it's gotten bigger and bigger. He had a bestseller during that time on emotional intelligence, why it can matter more than IQ. And many people believe that you get to these senior ranks because of your intelligence and your technical prowess, and we're going to unpack that in a little while. But really, the higher up you go, more of it's dependent upon your EQ, not your IQ, correct? Right. And and 
not that IQ isn't important or technical prowess, right? Those are important skills that we need to have oftentimes early on in our career as we're building our careers and we're, we're learning and building teams. But as we grow as leaders, those things become less important because now I have to get things done through other people, which requires me then to be good at communication and motivating and engaging and retention. EQ becomes more and more important as time goes on for leaders than it was earlier in their career. And so that's why it's it's important to have both. But EQ with a senior leader is more important at some point. And you also indicate in research, which which I've seen as well, that research has shown that EQ is the highest for middle managers. And it typically drops off as you go higher and higher in the ranks. Yeah, I know. It's such a surprise. And I, when I saw that data, I was thinking, well, where does it go? Like, if you, Because a lot of senior leaders get promoted from middle management. So I'm like, well, if you have it, it's like, here's your promotion. There goes your EQ. What, what happens? Where is it? And that's when these these traps really showed up because I thought, oh, I, I can't use self-awareness if no one's giving me real feedback. I can't use change my behavior, change my self-control if no one tells me that what I'm doing is ineffective. So it's it's just, again, a blind spot for a lot of executive leaders. It's not that they don't have EQ. It's that they're really not using the EQ they have. What are the most common issues for managers? And, and you give a few in the book on why they're not getting the feedback and building a feedback culture within their organization. Yeah, it, and it's it's not uncommon. I mean, we all have blind spots, myself included, like, uh, you know, I'm working on a lot of this too. I'm like, oh, this book was actually written for me because <laughs> I do almost all of these. Because it, it, one, it's hard to ask for feedback, you know, for a lot of people. And and I have had leaders who will, who will ask and might be very gracious when they're given feedback, but then they don't actually do anything with it. And so there's kind of the two parts. One, are you open when people give you feedback, especially feedback you don't like or don't want to believe about yourself or don't agree with, can you still be open and gracious about it so you're not defensive and that, that can shut people down if you are? But also then, what are you doing with that feedback? Because I had one team I was working with that the leader was struggling and they rated her very low on her listening skills. But when I asked about feedback, does she ask for feedback? Oh, yes. She asked for feedback all the time. And we give her that feedback, but nothing ever changes. So why are we doing it? Now we're just giving up on her. And when she asks for feedback, we're like, no, everything's great. Because we know it's not going to matter. So we have to show people that we're actually internalizing the feedback and doing something with it if we want it to continue. And we might you know, there's that intimidation factor. No one wants to be seen as critical or not a team player or, you know, that they're not on board with the program, if you will. And so there's there's some fear around giving a leader true feedback out of retaliation or a concern for reputation. What I've heard a good piece of advice from Marshall Goldsmith a while ago, and it, he kind of incorporates that into all of his training is that the best thing you can do when someone gives you feedback is just say thank you, right? Promise that you're going to act upon it. Say you'll consider it. Thank you for it. And stop at that point. Don't become defense, defensive. Don't lash out because that's going to eliminate that from happening ever again. And it's really the higher you go in any organization, the lonelier it gets at the top. And it's so critical to get that feedback so you become more self-aware, so you improve your EQ, your emotional intelligence, because otherwise you operate in this vacuum that makes it very hard for you to really know how you're perceived by others. Exactly. You, that feedback is critical to your success. And I like to ask, yeah, say thank you, absolutely, and, and show them that you appreciate it. But I also suggest maybe ask a few questions like, when was the last time you saw me do that? Is this something that I've done for a while or is this something new that you're noticing? Is this something I do in a large group more often or one-on-one? -on -one? So you can have some context for where this perception is coming from and kind of maybe in your mind, go back to that point and say, 
oh, that day I was extremely frustrated with X, Y, Z, but it came across that I was upset with this one person who actually had nothing to do with why I was really frustrated. So you, you can that way kind of connect the dots a little bit for yourself between what's going on up here and how it's being portrayed, you know, behaviorally so that you can be more mindful of it in the future. That's a great insight because a lot of time what you think and the perception of others, there's this chasm. So having those questions, right, asking those questions really makes a difference so you can connect them and really kind of understand more of where they're coming from. Hopefully it'll minimize your defensiveness as well. And, and you have a great vehicle, which I think is common in the profession, but for leaders that don't know about it, love for you to talk about the tool that really helps, you know, getting that feedback. And that's that 360 feedback assessment. Yes. A 360 feedback assessment is a common tool that we use to help get that feedback in a more safe way, if you will. And there's a couple of ways we do it. One is with an actual assessment typically online. And so the leader takes it about themselves and answers all the questions, but then we give that same question set of questions to their stakeholders. So the people around them, the people they might work for, report to, their peer group, their direct reports, and maybe some others around the organization they work with often. And that way we get like that 360 feedback loop, right? How, how is this person being seen by all these different groups and how aligned is their self-perception to everyone else's? And then many have comments. So we can add in, you know, questions like what is this person's greatest leadership strength? What is one area they can work on to improve? So we get a, a little bit of color commentary, if you will. And then I've also done what I call source interview 360s, where I will call out to those people, I will ask a set of questions of them, and then I will gather that data and provide back a summary for the leader. So that way we can kind of personalize the questions we want to ask if there's a particular area. A lot of the online tools are somewhat generic, you know, they're the same for everybody. But this way we can drill into exactly what we want to get, and then I can protect the readers anonymity that way as well. It's such a great tool should be used at least once a year. Uh, but it's, it's invaluable in getting that feedback that a lot of leaders need. With each trap, I love how you kind of end it where you say, now let's apply the three R's, which is recognize, read and respond. Just go into that framework a little bit for the listeners and, and kind of unpack it maybe for this trap. And I can kind of go through some of the stuff that you put down for this trap as well regarding that framework, but I'd love for you to unpack that framework first so that leaders can get some context. Sure. Um, so emotional intelligence actually uh, was started with a clinical psychologist in Canada, Dr. Reuven Baron, and he's the one who coined the term EQ, emotional quotient. And that was kind of pre-Dan Goleman's written work. So the idea though is that you've got this set of skills that allows you to have more self-awareness, more social awareness. And so I wanted to come with some kind of easy way to define what emotional intelligence or EQ is. And that's where the three R's came from. So it's really recognizing yourself. The first R is knowing who you are, knowing your strengths, knowing your weaknesses, but knowing your moods and how your moods might be affecting the way you're listening or what you're doing. So it's recognizing, reading others. So that's where the social awareness comes in, kind of reading the room, as it were, reading people's reactions to what you're saying and doing, picking up on their preferred communication style, and then responding appropriately for that person or situation, instead of either taking a one size fits all approach, right? I'm the same with you, with you, with you, doesn't matter who you are. I am me. So it's recognizing, reading, responding. So the three R's kind of play in, in all situations, you know, kind of doing a self check-in. How am I feeling about this right now? How is that coming across? What does this person in front of me need me to do? And then how do I mindfully respond in an appropriate way? The next ego trap, I think a lot of leaders struggle with, um, and that's believing your technical skills, your leadership skills. Because what I've seen, and I'm sure you've seen the same thing, Jen, is, is a lot of people get into leadership positions based on their technical skills, not based on their leadership skills. And now they're being judged by a completely different metric and they're not ready. 
Exactly. It's not uncommon that we take our technical expert or, you know, whoever's really good at the job and promote them. But what they're doing might be very different than the skills that are needed to then have work done through others. So they can struggle if we haven't considered the leadership side or at least provided some training for them once they do get promoted so that they are picking up that other side because leadership skills are very different than technical skills. And I see it with with founders too a lot of times when I'm working with founder-led organizations because, you know, when you're young in a company and you're just starting out, you have to do a lot when you're the owner and you might have been the, the chief technical officer or whatever, whatever the core business is, you know it better than anybody. And so as you grow, it's so important to start letting go of some of that stuff. And you just feel like, well, they're never ready. I don't have the right team yet. I, I just need to give them a little more time. But the problem is you end up hindering your own growth because you're doing too much yourself and everyone comes to you to solve all the problems. Then you have to transition your role, right, from working in the business to working on the business. And that is tough. And once people reach that C-suite, that senior executive level, like you mentioned, there's technical and functional expertise matters less than leadership skills. And a strong grasp of the business fundamentals is key. But it's not going to be enough to keep the company moving in the right direction because that focus needs a change by the leader. It does. But I always say like, by the time you're promoted to the C-suite or in the C-suite, you have to be a generalist because yes, you need to know the core business, but you also need to know the accounting and finance side and you need to know the talent management side and you need to know the sales and marketing side. You need to know a little bit enough about all of those things to be a successful C-level leader and not just the one subject matter that might've gotten you promoted the path you were on to get yourself there. Can you give a great example of a story of Gary in the book who, for him to continue his development, he needed to really kind of focus on the triggers that brought out his tendency to solve people's challenges with technical solutions. So he had to have that self-awareness. He had to remember that his way is not the only way and seeing that, you know, the failure can provide employees with some of the richest learning opportunities. So that's that empathy piece, right? Being able to read other people. And, and he gave them, you know, people time to think of themselves and, and come to their own conclusions without giving them the right answers immediately, which, you know, that's that self-control piece. I love that story in the book, how you illustrated this trap and going through those three R's. Yeah, it, it's a common thing. I mean, as leaders, it's hard not to want to just give the answers. Um, if you're not going to do it yourself, then telling someone else, here's how you do it. And you think you're being helpful and you're trying to be supportive, but really we're still hindering them from doing their own critical thinking and problem solving. And so it's, it's painful. I will admit, sometimes you're sitting there thinking, how do they not get what to do? <laughs> like, this is so obvious what to do, but really forcing people to work through some of that on their own can build a much stronger team. And again, one that's scalable. Absolutely. Another common issue that I see with senior leaders, which, which is another trap, that they fall into is surrounding people like yourself. If you did it well, if you're successful, then why not just have miniature versions of yourself that you hire for? Because they're going to be successful as well, right? Right, and everyone gets along because you, you know, you have so much in common. You think alike. It's very common to see a, a group around the leader who has either worked with them a long time or has a lot of similar experience. And so this is really where that whole diversity play comes in is, am I bringing in people who think different? Am I bringing in people who maybe had different experiences, other industries, other locations around the globe? Can we really encourage people who don't think all the same getting on the team so that I'm getting those other perspectives. And, and I had one leader recently that I was working with who, you know, he, his personality was pretty um, strong, I'll say. And he was known to be quite frank and vigorous in his debates and arguments with his team. And he really encouraged that with others. And so their senior meetings would get quite heated and, and pretty loud at times. And even sometimes name calling, and afterward, I said, you know, how do you feel about 
people yelling at you in these meetings as the CEO. That's not a common thing I see. And he said, I love it because it tells me they care. They care about the business enough to fight me on a decision they don't agree with. And they're able to communicate to me why they think I'm wrong. And I can't build a successful business. And this is a wildly successful business in the end. I mean, they're, they are, you know, Fortune 100 and phenomenally successful. And, and a lot of it is because of the way he's running the business with the team behind the, behind the scenes. And it's sometimes off-putting to people when you see a leader who's that aggressive, let's say, but it, it leads to really strong decision-making when you can do it right. How about the other extreme when you're awakened to the realization that everyone on your team looks and thinks an awful lot like you? What do you do now? Yeah, it is. You know, it's it's not that you're not getting the feedback because it's just there is no other feedback to get. Everyone thinks everything's great because you're all thinking too much the same. And so that's when I think you really have to have a team or somebody who who is comfortable to be the challenger, whether that's somebody that you just on the side, sometimes a coach, a business coach can play that role because, you know, we don't have anything at stake. We can challenge you and it's not going to result in a job change or a demotion. We can question things because we don't necessarily have all the history or the emotional connection to it. So having some kind of an outside voice, perhaps that can maybe challenge some of the group's thinking, whether you bring that person into the team or you do it one-on-one, -on -one, or you just have somebody in your life. Maybe it's a mentor or a business colleague that you've worked with a long time that you can run ideas by just to make sure that group think isn't really happening. Another common issue, especially I see with new, in it, with new leaders coming up through the ranks, is they like to micromanage. And it's hard for them to let go of certain things because they feel like if it's going to be done right, they have to do it, or they at least have to be involved in the process. So, but when a leader fails to let go and control over these tasks, um, then it minimizes the impact and of the other team members. And they feel like that the leader really doesn't trust them. It's a balance. I get that. And you don't want to delegate too much too soon and, you know, create so much stress in somebody or so much failure in them that you kill their confidence, but you also can't hold on to everything forever either. And I sometimes see, I have a leader right now I'm coaching and I told him the other day, I said, I, I see your style being very zero or 60. It's like, completely hands off, delegates it and says, here's the deadline. I'll look at it when it's time and lets them just completely go on their own unassisted. And then, or dives deep, deep into it and says, okay, I want to be in all the meetings. I want to see what you're preparing before any presentations are done. I want to run through the decks. And I said, it's confusing to the team to have a leader that's either zero or 60. So, so you have to kind of moderate here in the middle. I get that this person is trying to let go of stuff, and, but you can't go cold turkey either. So it, it, if you could do it gradually and really ask yourself, is this something I need to be involved in? Is this something that I can, is the risk low enough that if they completely whiff on it, it won't be the end of the world? Those are the ones that you can really start to hands off. But still doing some check-ins once I'm not saying you're, you're, you need to let go completely, but be smart about it and really ask yourself. Sometimes we just get in the habit. We do stuff because we've always done it. We do stuff because we're the best at it or we're the fastest at it. And we have to sometimes pause and say, is this really something I should be doing? Is this something that I've got someone else now that's ready to take on? So just having kind of that self audit, if you will, around your workload and making a goal every year to let more and more go would be ideal. And it's hard sometimes though with new leaders to say, well, let this go and let's identify the areas where you can differentiate yourself and possibly your brand because they feel like I've gotten here. So now if I let start, if I let things go, then maybe I'm being second guessed. You know, should I let too much go? Cause then what value do I bring to the table? Yeah. And that's real. I get that. Cause we get promoted, you know, kind of back to the technical skills conversation, we get promoted on those skills. And then all of a sudden we're told one day, stop doing that. <laughs> it's like, wait a second, this is who I am. This is how I built my reputation. 
And so it, it is hard to kind of make that transition away from our comfort zone. And when I do coaching, one thing I've really noticed and I spend a lot of time on is be careful not to overuse your strengths. A lot of time, kind of the Marshall Goldsmith, like what got you here won't get you there. And so you have to realize that I'm not always telling you to do something new. A lot of times I'm telling you do less of this because you are overusing the strength to the point where it's now hurting you. And so it's same idea with, you know, the delegating and not letting go of control. It's like, you need to pull back on this now. This is now at a point where it's not good for you anymore. It's not good for the team. And so just stop doing it so much. But recognizing when that is, is really the key. That's where self-awareness comes back in again. What do you do when you don't trust your team to get the job done? How do you handle that? Well, it's funny because the way to build trust is through trust. You know what I mean? If I never let you do anything, I'm never going to know what you can do. And so I have to pick things that I can just completely let go of to see what people do with it. What I see happen sometimes is if I have a history of double checking work, then when I trust somebody to do something and they know I'm going to look at it anyway, they have a tendency to not worry about it. Cause they're like, ah, oh, Jen will look at it and fix anything I didn't have in here. That's right. So it's not really delegating or trust. So what you have to do is start to really test that trust and really give them something that you're not going to double check and let them know it's not going to be double checked because then they'll take it seriously and possibly step up. But trust happens over time. You know, trust is, it comes from uh, accountability, consequences, and feedback. Absolutely. So the next one, the next trap, I love because I was unaware of this trap <laughs> until I really read the book, but it it's common. And I think if you want to build your EQ, you need to be aware of it, being blind to the downstream impact. And what you say is that this trap really manifests itself in executive attention deficit hyperactive ED ADHD. Love it. Very common. Actually, one of the stats that we came across is um, if you are diagnosed with ADHD, you are 300% more likely to start your own business. <laughs> so we have a lot of entrepreneurs with ADHD out there. And it's not, it, it's, uh, some of it is demands of a busy organization require you to constantly be moving around and changing direction and focus. But we also have to really be aware that when we change too fast, we can create a ton of downstream impact that you may not realize and disruption to people, um, you know, kind of in the rank and file. And then another common uh, thing that leaders do under this trap is kind of level skip, if you will. Uh, you know, there's somebody in the company that they've worked with in the past or somebody who they know who does something they want does it well. And so they have a tendency to just skip the levels, skip the leaders that those people report to and go right to them and say, Hey, can you work on this report for me? Or can you look over this for me? And it creates like this whole dilemma for people because if their leader doesn't know they're working on it, but the executive asked for it, you know, they feel like they need to take that as a priority. Other work might fall aside. So there's a wake. There's there's definitely a bubble around the executive. And when the executive is doing things, there's always going to be a ripple effect. And so just being really aware of that is the point of that trap. When, and you even have another term here, which I love too, is um, you know, that submarine boss, right? Where they're just silent for a period of time. And then suddenly they resurface and create all this chaos, knock everyone off of their tasks that they were doing. And now they're trying to adjust, like you said, downstream level jumping not only to their direct reports, but well below that. And everyone's now re-engaged on something else, creates a lot of chaos and uncertainty um, within the organization. Yeah. And, and it can happen when the leader is traveling and they may just go dark for a while while they're maybe overseas or on the road. And then they come back and it's just like, whoa, here comes the flood of things that they're going to want. Or they may be you know, in and out of work, you know, they may be at a point in their career where they're taking time off and so they're away and then they come in and it's like, 
they want to rearrange everything around them. They may have remote locations. And when everyone's together is when they bring their 25 item list of to do's. And then again, it just, it can be very disruptive to the workflow. So just having the awareness around it is really key. And the next draft really talks to that awareness too, which I see this quite common with leaders is that they underestimate how much they're being watched. So they feel like that their actions aren't being watched that closely, or it's no big deal what they do in certain contexts. And it could be big things, but more likely it's, it, it's the more subtle things that because the team, the organization learns by watching you. They, which parts of the company are most and least important? What's acceptable and unacceptable in, in terms of behavior? What must be followed and what rules can be broken, right? Uh-huh, exactly. And I think, I think leaders do lose the appreciation for how much people pay attention to that stuff. When do they send emails? What time of day? When do they break the rules for themselves or the people on their team? And so it's really important that they remember that they are role modeling the behavior for the rest of the organization. And if they say one thing, but do something else, of course, it sends a very different message. So it, it's just a watch out to recognize that everything you're doing right now, if you see a behavior in the organization you don't love, take a hard look and make sure that they're not learning it from you. When I see that, like what you mentioned too, when you're sending out emails, because I hear this a lot from leaders and they say, well, I'm passionate. I love this. This is my life's work, my passion. I'm, I just don't understand why my subordinates, why my managers aren't equally passionate about this and, and they don't have the same motivation. So there's that disconnect, that lack of self-awareness there as well to say, they're watching what I'm doing. Why aren't they doing the same thing? Why aren't they as motivated? It's an easy thing to question. And, you know, I have to remind them, well, they don't own the business, you own the business. So that's one big difference right there, or they're not getting paid as much as you to work seven days a week. So that could be another difference. But I think the other thing is like when we do EQ assessments, we measure things like self-actualization, which is being fulfilled by the work I'm doing, feeling like I'm growing and increasing and adding value. Not everyone has the same level of self-actualization in their jobs. Um, Stress tolerance is another example. I may have very high stress tolerance as a senior leader because I need to, but the people around me may not have that same sense of stress tolerance or ability to tolerate stress. So I'm a poor judge. I'm a poor self-measure stick. Like if I'm not feeling stressed, Eh, things are pretty good. I'm not feeling that stress. We can pull that deadline in. We can add this to the scope. But that doesn't mean that people around me aren't feeling way more stress than I am because my scale is off a little bit. I've got such high stress tolerance. I can't translate that or assume everyone else is in the same place. So it's the same idea. It's like, you have to have that empathy to appreciate that even though I'm not feeling it right now, or I am feeling this right now, it doesn't automatically mean everyone else is. Well, and it's so important getting back to those assessments, having those assessments done so you can see scales like your self-actualization, stress tolerance, which will give you some insight into your state and really also recognizing that people are on different parts of the scale, right? So not assuming things, you're getting good data that supports that perception of you and hopefully how in line or out of line it is with with others that work with you. Exactly. And it's a strength. I mean, you can't argue it's a strength to have self, you know, stress tolerance, for example. Flexibility is another example. So if I have really high flexibility, that's easy to see as a strength. Too much flexibility, now I might fall into that trap of downstream impact because I'm so comfortable with change. I'm changing things so rapidly, the team isn't isn't recovering from all that change. They have change fatigue, perhaps. But I'm like, oh, this is great. I'm so flexible. I love the change. So it's keeping everything in balance. Let's move into the next trap, which this is this is if if not the most common for me, it's it's the top two, and that's losing touch with frontline experience. Because as you go up in the organization, you I see this frequently, right? People just disconnected of what work is really like. They're not on the front line. They're not talking to customers. They're not talking to the front line managers or supervisors to really 
have that feedback that is so critical in moving the company forward to make sure that these still stay relevant, timely, and offer great solutions to customers' problems. It is, it is so common to lose touch and so vital, especially in today's world, that we know what the customers are thinking. And I, you know, a lot of organizations have moved over to uh, the voice of the customer, some kind of a program where they are getting a net promoter score or something, some way to get that feedback into the organization. But it's even listening to that frontline employee team, you know, taking time to make sure you're doing focus groups with them. They they know what's the real issues, you know, that the customers are having with the company. And so they are a wealth of knowledge if we can make sure that we're listening to them. And, you know, I see a lot of leaders who say, well, I have an open door, an open door policy. But the reality is, you know, a frontline employee is not going to make an appointment with the COO to say, let me share with you all the frustrations that my team and I have and all our customers are telling us, you know, it's just not going to happen. So it has to be a very deliberate activity to go seek out that information uh, because it won't happen just naturally. It's just the natural dynamic of leader follower. I love some of these that you give just letting people know if they've fallen in this trap, you know, do you have employees come to your office for a meeting instead of going to theirs? Another one is you don't periodically spend time working alongside employees for a day in the life experience. You know, you see that on Undercover Boss, where these realizations happen with these bosses that have not spent near enough time on the front line since the company grew, and now they're out of touch, right? So they learn a lot more about their business if they can have these day in the life experiences. Yeah, I, I love that show because it really does show you how hard <laughs> that frontline works and how often it surprises the executives, what they ask them to do every day and the tools, whether they work or don't work and decision making, you know, decisions that get made in a conference room at a corporate office may be way off base for what's real out in the field. And so making sure that you are, are taking advantage of those exercises before you make big decisions that would affect that front line. The final one that you give is, you say is perhaps the greatest sin of all, and that really is the relapsing to your old way. So the change is not sticking. All of these ego traps in the book are common. I've seen them all with leaders, some more common than others in my area, but you know, all of them a leader can improve upon. But if you're making a positive change in your behavior, avoiding a trap, becoming more emotionally intelligent, then you want that change to last. Otherwise, it sends a very different message to everyone around you to say, well, I guess there's this ego relapse and um, he's only doing it on certain days. So now I, it hurts the trust, right? It hurts the effectiveness of a leader and how you're perceived by others. Yeah, exactly. And I, you know, nobody's perfect and no one expects a leader to be perfect all the time, a hundred percent. But I think if they see you really making the effort and trying, and then you have a bad day and you say, you know what, <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm having a really tough day today. I know I shouldn't have snapped at you for that. You know, they'll give you a pass because they see that you are working on this and that you're you're earnestly trying to have emotional intelligence every day. You're going to have a bad day. It's when they see it kind of turned on and off that I think you lose the credibility. And I share a story in the book about a leader who would turn it on when customers were around and then turn it off when it was just him with his staff. And that's the problem, you know, because the staff sees that other guy when they're in front of the customer. And so then they feel like, oh, you can be kind and polite and, and self-aware. You choose not to be when it's us. And so that's back to, again, underestimating how much you're being watched. People see us in different scenarios with different audiences. And when they see EQ being turned on with one group and turned off with another, that's what we have to really be aware of. We have to make sure we're striving to use EQ every day with everybody. And in the long run, you do get better results. I'm not going to say this is a, an effortless activity. It definitely takes effort to recognize, read, and respond. But those that take the time to do that get much stronger relationships, better employee engagement, which leads to higher retention, which leads to higher profitability. So all of these skills, even though we're kind of seeing them as soft skills, you know, I mentioned how long I've been in talent management in those days, we just called it training. And when I was always like on the leadership or communications 
skills side of the house. And that was like soft skills. We were the soft skills trainers. And, you know, what we know now is that these are not soft skills. These are, this is a true behavioral science. There's a lot of brain activity that goes on when it comes to, in fact, Dan Goldman's later book called Social Intelligence is really good. It's it's a heavy read because it gets really into the biology of the brain and the way the neural pathways are formed and the way that we respond, what the limbic system does related to emotional intelligence. So if you're interested in more of the, the science side, that's a great read. So there is a lot biologically happening, neuro- neurologically happening with emotional intelligence. And it's really just understanding that whole process so that we can be smarter in the way that we behave and control the one thing we can control, which is us. And the good news is that what you recommend is that none of us will fall into all of these traps, right? Usually we just have one or two that tend to be our constant companion. So the question is, how do we get better at identifying what those are? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. It's a good way to put it. Our constant companion, right? It's like, dang, just when I think I'm letting go, I'm not. It's really good, again, to get some feedback and start with some kind of a a self-assessment, whether that's a formal tool, whether it's somebody getting you that feedback, it's reading the book, and and there is also a self-assessment in the book as far as which traps might be more common for you. And then, you know, again, the way we know adults learn is not a ton at once. We don't want to make a ton of changes, but really focus on, let's just say one thing. I'm going to spend the next month focusing on my talking listening ratio. And if we just did that, if we just picked that one thing and spent all month considering how often do I speak up? How often do I interrupt? How often do I lead the conversation maybe in a way I want it to go instead of the way it might naturally go? So it's, it's raising, you know, making it a small change and then really paying attention to the way it's being reacted to. That can be the most powerful way to change behavior permanently. That's some great insight and a great call to action to end this episode on, you know, spend a few minutes a day and watch the benefits unfold as your emotional intelligence starts to flow more naturally throughout all your interactions. And it will come more naturally. The more you do it, you know, like everything, right? The more you do it, the easier it'll be. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Jen, for joining me on this episode. Remind our listeners how they can get in contact with you and learn more about your work. So I have two websites. My first one is penumbra.com. And um, you can find sample EQ assessments there that you can download and take a look at. There's webinars free, a lot of free content, articles, my blog. Um, We have uh, free webinars online. So feel free to check that out under the resources tab. And then I have my jenshirkani.com page, which just gives more details about my speaking topics and some of the applications of emotional intelligence for leaders. I hope this episode has provided you with valuable insights. If it has, I ask you to share it with someone who would also benefit from it. If you've been enjoying and gaining knowledge from this podcast, then subscribe to our YouTube channel where you can find all the previous episodes of the podcast and additional learning resources. You can also subscribe to the podcast on Apple or Spotify and leave up to a five-star review.